another three hours of the regular show on Terrestrial Radio, and you wanted a little bit more, so that's why you found the Gun Talk After Show podcast, where we saved all the best things that we can't say on regular radio. Now, here's Tom, Michelle, and Jim for the Gun Talk After Show. It's the After Show, and yes, we are still at Gunsight because I'm not leaving. They will not get rid of me that easily. Jane Ann has joined us. Jane Ann Shimizu from Gunsight. We have Jim and Michelle as well, so it's a whole foursome. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi, Tom. Okay. Who's driving the cart? Who's going to drive the golf cart? I don't know. Oh, that's right. It's a foursome. Cool. I like that. I finally caught up. Cool. All right, so, Michelle, I was telling Jane Ann about your store, and, you know, you've been working with, with women, and they come in wanting to buy guns, and it's kind of like, you know, what do I do? And we keep talking, training, training, training. Mm-hmm. And I would just kind of like for you guys to talk about what you see and maybe a little bit about how things have changed over the last even 20 years, because you've both been at this that long, you know, because the idea of women coming and getting trained 20 years ago wasn't that common, was it? Not for me. Yeah. I, I was probably one of two women in my 250 pistol class in 1994. Okay. Which isn't very many women. Mm-mm. I had a blast. <laughs> <clears throat> Loved every minute of it. But, but it was apparent then that, that women aren't going to spend money on training. And it's apparent now because women aren't going to take a $1,700 class. Mm-hmm. They're going to look at the $1,100 class or the $1,000 class, or they're going to join the well-armed women for 50 bucks a year. But women are not going to commit money into training like men do. Men, hmm. That's interesting. It, that's just my opinion, but mm-hmm. it's what we see. Michelle, you know, it's, you, you've got to come in there. They want to buy a gun, but it's, it's hard to get them to, to think about taking lessons, isn't it? It can be at first, and I have to agree. We didn't see very many women on the shooting side of, of our life until concealed carry came about and and more women started to get involved then. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was mm-hmm. always those few immersed target shooters. But, I, you know, the biggest problem about the whole deal is having them come in without an opinion already or mm-hmm. without somebody's suggestion already because it's like, well, somebody told me I needed a Glock. Well, that might be great for that other person, but let's put it in your hand. And to get them to open up and and be objective to trying several different firearms and, and, you know, a couple of different types of calibers, that takes some time. It it takes a lot of trust to get into that side of it. Yeah, into that side of it. Do you still have the deal of women coming in and say, oh, yeah, that I want that little small gun there? Oh, yeah. That doesn't change. You know, they, the cute little guy. It, that's little it. Guy. I was going to say, they think because it's cute and it's small that it's going to be perfect. And, of yeah, course, this will, be, this will be easy to shoot. It's, yeah. You have, that, you have that in pink, right? <laughs> right. Purple, teal, <laughs> any color you want almost now. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but it, it is difficult. And, and it's a barrier that has to be broken. But it is one that comes off of, off of trust and education. I mean, that's what we have always based our conversation off of. Let me educate you a little bit. You know, what do you want to do with this is going to ultimately depend on what side of the spectrum we go as far as firearms are. I had a lady in my well-armed woman. She was new to the well-armed woman. And she called me one day and she said, I came last month and your instructor told me that I had to have a different mag pouch and a different holster. But I don't know how to explain that to my husband. So can I bring him out to Gunsight and you explain it to him because I can't get through to him. So she brought him out to Gunsight. We went to the conference room. We pull out her gear and she's got a floppy cotton little mag Awful pouch thing. that when you go to put your mag back in it, it collapses and the, the holster has a big strap over it and it collapses. And we actually had to show him what she needed before he would agree that that's what she needed. Wow. No, wow. this is fine. Well, and, and actually I got Ken involved and, and we were showing him, this is how you have to do this. Well, this he, he, didn't, he didn't it. know what, what it means to draw a gun and maybe more importantly to reholster a gun because you have to be able to do it with one handed. Mm-hmm. You can't be reaching back with your off hand and trying to hold your holster, the mouth of your yeah. holster open while you're sticking a gun down in there. Yeah. And we actually had to say to her, you can't come back unless you have better gear. Because it's not safe. It's not safe. Right. And therefore, she came in with her husband. When she came back, it wasn't perfect, but it was 75% better than what she had to begin with. Right. They, they went safer. with the cheap. You know, and it's hard to go to a gun store and buy what you really need. 
because all the gun stores around here, they carry stuff you can really afford, which right. isn't what you need. It, right. that, it, it's an interesting point. Michelle, it's a challenge you have where you're thinking, okay, I know what they need, but they're not going to be willing to spend this. Right. I mean, the most popular holster in the world is probably $15 at retail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. that's the one that everybody wants because it's very easy. Everybody can afford it. The problem right. is, is that it's not practical for use of drawing and reholstering. I mean, you just can't reholster it one handedly. You have to use both hands. Well, that takes, you know, out of a situation possibly, which is and what we don't and Honestly, it. it's just not safe because about nine times out of ten when I see people use those, they reach over with their, if they're right handed, reach over with the left hand hold the mouth of the holster mm. open, and then sweep the muzzle right across the top of their hand, right? Yeah. I mean, you've seen oh, this. I right? just showed you, yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> it's frightening. Yeah. And, and you have to educate them. We have to educate them, and it's not an easy job. Well, it's okay, that's an interesting question. How do we get to women, but also to men, the idea, and it's weird because men will say, well, yeah, this is a really good gun. I want to spend, I'll spend the extra money on the gun, and then they buy cheap crap for their holster, and especially for the belt, <clears throat> try to get by with a wide Walmart belt. Well, I've got a, <laughs> I got a wide belt here. You're going, yeah, you know, if you clipped a knife onto that thing, it would turn inside out. <laughs> Much less a two-and-a-half-pound pistol. Because people don't understand what kind of heavy-duty belt you're talking about. They've never seen one. Yeah. I had a lady come to the well-armed woman, and before they come, I say, you need this, you need this, you need all of this gear to participate, right? She comes in, and I said, and where's your belt? Well, my pants don't have belt loops. Well, didn't my email tell you that you needed pants with belt loops? Yeah, but I don't have any. Right. Don't own any pants with belt loops. Then you need to come back. Then I'm sorry. Day. This is not going to work because there's there's no system for us to, what are we going to hang this gun on? It's, it's... And they don't understand. A web belt. If you say a web belt, one of them came with a lightly webbed a nice, leather a nice, belt that yeah, was a little, pretty. Yeah, it's very pretty, and yeah. it's lightweight and doesn't do anything. That's why for our 250 class, we all we all carry our gear exactly like we want them to carry our right. gear That's so that they can see us and they can go, ah, oh, okay, now I, know. now I know what to do with all that stuff I just bought. Well, there Michelle, are- I was telling... I mean, I'm sorry, go ahead, Michelle. Well, I was going to say, there are some men that will completely disengage from the conversation and allow on the retail side for you mm. to take over. And it's it's awkward. I mean, it is a real plus for gun stores to have a female oh, yeah. in their store that is educated on not just firearms, but on the accessories. Because it comes down to what is her life valued at? Because the holster counts, the belt counts, extra magazines count. All of these things are life-saving if needed. And you don't know if you're going to need them. Right. So when they disengage and allow you to put different belts on them and different holsters on them and feel what we mean by can't and and not can't like you can't do it, but the can't of a holster. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, we knew what you meant. <laughs> yeah. But, to, but yes. to get the feel of you know, three o'clock and six o'clock and appendix carry and all these things. It takes some time. I sure. mean, you're you're yeah. dealing with them for an an hour plus, easy. How do you break them out? Because I know so often the man wants to buy her and wants to drive the conversation. Basically, uh, and you've had it where you ask her a question and he answers, right? Right. Yes. So how do you separate them? How do you make that happen? By kindly saying to them, this is about her and how the gun feels to her. What feels right to you is not going to feel right to her. You would not wear her high heel shoes. She would not wear your hiking boots. (laughs) I mean, it comes down to something that simple. I think either that or a taser. Just go ahead and (laughs) knock him out, (laughs) drop him to the floor. By the time he comes to, she's already got the stuff she needs. It works out for everybody. It's great. <laughs> when they come to Gunsight together, we put them on separate relays mm-hmm. because it is inevitable if they are near each other, she's going to be upset. Uh-huh. He's going to get mad. And so if they're on separate relays, he has they're not no on, control. They're not on the line together yep. at all. They're not. not shooting next to each other. And that is why it's easier to take lessons from somebody that you're not attached to 
than somebody oh, that yes. you are because no it takes away that frustration level, which, by the way, is not safe with a firearm. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Just like to All point right, out the obvious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hold that thought. We'll come back. And Michelle can talk about what it's been like for her being taught to shoot by, let's see, husbands, fathers, maybe even your son these days. Right. Holy cow. That's right. We'll be right back. The next big thing for the AR-15 has arrived. The Brownells BRN-180 Upper, a modernized version of the Armalite AR-180, featuring a 16-inch barrel, a 223 wild chamber, and a full-length pick rail. The BRN-180 skips the buffer system to allow complete function of the firearm with the stock folded or extended. Best of all, the Brownells BRN-180 mounts to any mil-spec AR lower. Visit brownells.com today. Taking the striker-fired category by storm, the CZP-10 delivers what most in the genre cannot. From the superb trigger to the purpose-driven features to the engineered ergonomics, the CZP-10 is the complete package right out of the box. With 12 plus 1 capacity in the P-10S, 15 plus 1 in the PC-10, and 19 plus 1 in the P-10F, there's a P-10 for every purpose. For more information, please visit cz-usa.com. All right, we're having some fun here with the after show. We got uh, Jane and Chimizu from Gunsight. I'm sitting here at Gunsight with her. We got uh, Jim, we got Michelle, and it's kind of fun for me to listen to Jane Ann and Michelle talk because you guys, honestly, we're in the kind of the same world, but we're in different worlds. We have different firing lines. Yeah, we do. <laughs> totally. She's in a different, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like, okay, the questions that you get asked and the way that you can respond to them are different from what? The men can do, frankly. And it's not to be sexist about it, because the weird part is we're teaching the same thing. We're going to teach you the same way of shooting and moving and drawing and all that stuff, but we're teaching it in a different way or with a different slant. I, I don't know exactly how to say it, but it's, it's – I mentioned, by the way, I'm going to tell you, uh, Jane Ann, when I mentioned uh, Michelle's getting taught by family members, her son is now in the Army Marksmanship Unit, as was your husband. Correct. Yep. Yes. So if you if you can't shoot, you're in trouble in that family. <laughs> it was a tryout. I always say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you tried out for this job? Oh, yeah, I had to. Yeah. No, I oh didn't really. God. But that's what I always share. <laughs> you know, we, uh... we grew up having firearms in the home, but I had all sisters. And so we weren't exposed to going out and hunting and shooting and all of that. Although my dad and his brothers did all of that. Mm. It wasn't until actually that my husband now and I started dating that I was really exposed to the target side and shooting. And and he honestly taught and coached me as, you know, we did our children, what what it actually meant to shoot a shot and and the very basic, you know, what's sight picture and what's trigger control. And there's all these components that go into it. And Mm -hmm. for a newbie, it's a lot. You don't just pick up a gun and point it it down range and pull the trigger, which is what a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. You know, there's sight focus and and the difference between the rear and the front sight. And (laughs) it's complicated. (laughs) I'm reminded, good instructors, one of the things a good instructor does is understands how much we who've been at this a long time have learned because we have a tendency, if you're not really an instructor and haven't thought about it, we really don't have the ability to go back to square one and start, mm-hmm. you know, because we kind of make an assumption, well, well, everybody knows how to just pick up the gun, right? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. no, you know, and, and it's one of the things I love about Gunsight is you have a structured instruction pattern. And I don't care if you just won the world championship. If you're in this class, we're going to start you off with, here's how you hold a pistol. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you guys do. But I guess the point I'm making is for anybody who's listening, if you're going to teach somebody who's a beginner at this, you have to stop and go all the way back. And maybe you learned this stuff when you were eight years old. You know, front sight, rear sight. What is that? I mean, We, uh, we start out in the classroom. There is so much you can teach someone about firearms safety in the very beginning in the classroom. We spend an hour and a half in the 250 class in the classroom. Shooting range is actually not a good classroom. 
Because you show them the front sight, you show them the rear sight, right. you show them the parts of the gun, you, you, and you can, if you see it, then when you get out to the range, everything that you've seen will it hopefully clicks. transfer over right. into what we want you to do. Hmm. It's it, you know, we always talk about uh, in flying, an airplane is a really lousy classroom. And frankly, a shooting range can be a lousy classroom when you're trying to cover complex things because it's noisy, it's distracting, it's... And if you're new, it's just intimidating. Mm-hmm. It's intimidating to be out there. Women jump. I mean, my really? newbies, as you call them newbies, I call them newbies. Yeah. They, the first shot that goes off on the firing line, they race six inches into the they air. They actually jump. They yeah. actually jump. They're startled. They're startled. And you have, to, you have to be right there by them. You and you've got to down. find those ladies on the line and calm them down. Or they're just going to throw it down and leave. Well, I, I, got I oft- to hold them. I, I often compare that to hammering a nail. You're not going to be very successful at driving the nail into whatever it is you're working on if you don't have your eyes open and paying attention. But that's the knee-jerk reaction. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the eyes blink well, and, and you have this jerk reaction after the fact because it just scared you. <laughs> so it's, it's unnatural and uncomfortable to right. have an explosion going off three feet in front of your face. And so now you know what in, to in expect. Your hand, it's, yeah. And you naturally want to close your eyes. Well, you can't. You have to have them open. <laughs> you can't make something happen. This is a mind over matter thing. Right. And it, that it, it, that's yeah. really the biggest thing is under, getting them to understand that you can't force this to happen. If you just keep applying pressure to the trigger, this will naturally happen. And if it scared you, it is a perfect shot. I guarantee it. What about the role of encouragement in all of this? The need to be supportive and encouraging through particularly that those first you know, episodes. That is very, very important. And as a woman, I can do hands-on encouragement. I sometimes will have to put my hand on the back of her back so that she doesn't jump back. Uh, uh. But, but that's... I think that's comforting to some women, okay. to most women, and, and I will do that, and I will talk to them softly and tell them to gently press the trigger, gently. It's all fine. It's all good. And after about an hour, they can do it without me helping. And if you're a, a man instructor, you want to be careful about mm-hmm. those kind of mm-hmm. things. You, you might want to have the conversation, okay, are you okay if I just put my mm-hmm. hand on your back just for support here? Is that going to be okay? And you want to get the approval, get the okay before you do anything sure. like that. You know, it's just, but but real. most women, they're fine because they want that comfort. Sure. They need it Yeah. in the beginning. I'm talking newbie newbies. Never right. shot a gun before. Right. Exactly. I, I'm going to switch to another subject here because you were so excited to tell me about your knife. My knife? Your You're knife. Me. Yes. Okay. Jade Ann, your yeah. knife. Okay. Because, you know. You're out here in the middle of all of these instructors. You learn all this different stuff, right? Oh, there it is. She's got her knife. Okay. I <laughs> heard that. So you heard that, didn't you? <laughs> Theater of the mind. Yeah. We're going, yeah. It's like reset. <laughs> okay. So tell them where you got this knife. Where did you, you just pull that thing out I of? I pulled it out of my bra. I always carry <laughs> cool. a knife in my bra. I cool. carry it on the left side of my bra because I draw right-handed for you, it. You clip it to the shoulder strap? I, no, I clip it to the Into actual the, bra right okay. there. All right. And I have been carrying a knife since I took my first edge weapons class maybe five years ago, seven years ago. I use it at least three times an hour to eat, to cut things with. To mm-hmm. do th- it's a yep. tool. Yep. Yep. It is a tool, but it's a tool that's always with me. I just went to Idaho and visited my grandchildren. You don't know how many times they said, Grandma, you got your knife? Grandma, you got your knife? Because they realize that she's always got a knife. She is a sure. handy person. Well, I, I have the same. I keep a knife, and I do not wear it on my bra. So, oh. um, so But here's the question. Thanks why for that why visual. The, yeah. <laughs> why the bra? Because it's easy to get to. And if you're in a fight, and, and if, your if hands got to come into the, your, your uh-huh. right, they're going to be right in front of you. And if a guy's coming at you and you're going, hmm, okay, I'm just going to, he's not going to expect me to pull a knife out of my <laughs> when bra. When you reach into your bra, he doesn't expect a knife to come out. No, he, yeah, yeah. he does I don't know what he expects, but. But not that. <laughs> it is the best place to keep your knife because it's handy more than anything. And it, you've got the little spider coat. You see, they're not making those anymore. Well. I couldn't find them at the shot show. They've got a little, it's got a little, a little it's kind of a metal clip, not a, a clip. regular black clip. It's a little spring a little clip. Spring clip, and it's lightweight. It weighs absolutely yeah, it weighs nothing. nothing. You can't find one that's this light. I don't even know it's in there. Sometimes I I forget. And uh, I you know my friend Sonia carries a knife. Every every woman I know carries a knife. Anybody who's been through any in kind of serious bra. training. Yeah. Well, it's, it's your it, backup. It weapon. is a great position because I know guys that carry a. Uh, 
a neck clip. You know, it basically gets a, a lanyard and a knife kind of hanging right in the middle of their chest. Again, the idea being if you're in a fight, you may not be able to get down to your pocket or your belt, and your hands are probably going to be up in front of you. I mean, Jim, you know this from your all your martial arts stuff. Your hands are going to be in front of you from a defensive position, for one thing, right? If I'm not running away, absolutely. <laughs> And you I'm know, completely serious. So, as, yeah, no, as, I know. As anybody could, <laughs> right? Yeah. You have to treat your knife like you treat your, your dry fire. Mm-hmm. When, when you so. first start carrying a knife, you've got to draw. You've got to draw. You've got to draw. You have to dry fire that knife. You've got to dry fire that oh, knife. Because okay. if we're in an altercation and you're right up on me, I've got to be able to get you that knife out quickly. You can't be fooling around with it. You've got to be able to reach and get it and, and come back with it. If yeah. we're uh, bad breath close, I can, I can get you in the neck. I can get you in carotid arteries. And the knife is a very handy it's, little it's, thing. It's quite distracting to what people have intended to do when you stab them in the neck. <laughs> it's just amazing how that gets people to think about something else, like going away. Yes, <laughs> falling down. That's falling down. I would rather be shot than cut. It's funny. Steve Tarani was just talking about that. Okay. He's not here right now. Yep. You could tell people about Steve Tarani. And, I mean, people can't believe what somebody like that can do with a knife. Oh, he's so fast. Yeah. And you'll see in your training, he will teach you how to be fast. He is a gentle giant who moves slowly but concisely, and no movement is wasted when he does it. And he can take you and he can put you down just like that. He can teach you how to do that. He's he is amazing. It's hard to describe Steve Tarani because he's what six foot ten. He's, huge. he's, a, he's huge a huge guy. guy. Yeah, and he is quiet mm-hmm. and reserved and deadly. <laughs> and he he's very deadly. And what you're going to learn in this class, I can't even describe. It's I'm looking forward amazing. to it. I mean, it, grappling. It, you're going to be on it, the ground. It concerns me when every time I see Ken. He, Campbell, he keeps you saying, did you bring your ibuprofen with you? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> it sounds to me like you might need Band-Aids. <laughs> yeah. No, we don't train with sharp knives. Okay, do we have training knives? Yeah, he's got training knives that you'll be training with. Okay, so, I, yes. I need Nerf knives. Yeah, it's kind of a Nerf knife. Yeah, so when real soft, Michelle and I yeah. bought this uh, life insurance policy with you, uh, Tom, is that uh, <laughs> you're fine with that, right? <laughs> Yeah, right. You, you've been talking to Steve about that, I think. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but now oh, this we is a close deal. quarters pistol class. Right. It's, it's not a knife it's class. It's not a knife class. Yes. So you're going to be doing close quarters stuff. Like pushing elbows pushing, and, yes, hands and, and, and that kind of thing. And, and how to butt your way through a crowd. And, and that's important. Uh, I'm going to get through this crowd. How do I get through this crowd? And, and, and that's kind of There are of actually the techniques for that. Yes. Yes. Huh. Okay. So just shooting everyone in front of you doesn't qualify? No. Oh, okay. No, you have to get through the crowd in order to shoot the bad guy. Oh, darn. Okay. Boy, ever since ammo prices have come down, Tom, you're just looking for any excuse. That's right. Well, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Another quick break here, and then when we come back, Janie can tell us what she just did while we were doing radio for the last hour, okay? There's another reason we don't like you, because you get to go shoot your <laughs> stuff here. So, all right, we'll be right back. Whether you are a first-timer or seasoned shooter, Double Star has the guns, edged weapons, and parts you desire. Our products are made in America and held to the highest quality standards. No exceptions. Double Star and Ace Limited manufactures products people bet their lives on without hesitation. That awesome responsibility motivates the Double Star family, and it will proudly protect yours. When you're ready for the best, join our family at star15.com. That's star15.com. Built for personal and home protection, the Smith & Wesson M&P 380 Shield EZ Pistol features an easy-to-load magazine with load assist button, an easy-to-rack slide, and the M2.0 crisp trigger and enhanced grip texture. With its easy-to-rack, easy-to-pack, and easy-to-shoot design, the M&P 380 Shield EZ is perfectly sized 380 protection. Find out more at smith-wesson.com. All right, back with you here, and uh, when we came back, uh, I just finished up the show with Jane Ann. You walked in, and you looked like uh, you were a little bit worn out. I was a little What'd worn you out. Do? Well, I, when I walked out of here, there were two of my instructors out there getting ready to go shoot, and 
they warm up because they're going to start teaching tomorrow. Mm. And I said, can I shoot with you? Because I always have to shoot by myself. There's never anyone here to shoot with. <laughs> and so I went down with them and, whoa, did I get a workout. Oh, really? my God. They were, we, we called them Paul's Wacky School Drills from 25 yards. Let's shoot two to the body, reload, shoot two to the body and in less than four seconds. Oh, and, geez. So but they had me going. Was this drawing? And drawing. Sh- oh, yeah. Draw, shoot two, reload, reload shoot, shoot two. two in four seconds. Four seconds. I was at four and a quarter when I left. I said, okay, I'm done. Putting the pressure on. It is. Holy cow. But he had all these weird little school drills rigged up because they're practicing everything they're going to be teaching all week. Okay. And he he put them all into a school drill that we did from three yards out to 25 yards. And my opinion is if they're shooting at me from 25 yards, I'm going the other way. I am not shooting back. (laughs) Chances are they're probably not going to hit you. Most people don't practice. Yes. But at the same time, it's a real confidence builder to be able to hit stuff at 25 Mm -hmm. yards because that way you know you can. Yes. And I hit it. I just didn't hit it where I wanted it to go. It's more like a crotch shot instead of a chest shot. Well, that's distracting. Yes. Those are those are effective. Those are really effective. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and, and I know people say, well, you know, why would you do that with a pistol at that distance? Well, that's not self-defense distance. Except that when we had Andy Brown on, who wrote the book mm. uh, Warnings Unheated, there's an active shooter in the hospital at the Air Force Base where he was working. He ended up shooting this guy in the head at 72 yards with his Beretta 92. Mm. So he took out this active that, shooter with his yards. Yeah. 72 yards. Yeah, because he practiced all the time. He had decided he was going to make himself a really, really, really good shot. And just turned out that they had the right guy at the right place, right time. And he was the guy who could take a mm. shot. I mean, this guy had a rifle. He's killed people. Well, that's all part of this training, too, is knowing your limitations, maybe pushing them to that, but being extremely mm-hmm. confident within that range. I mean, that is why yeah. we train and not just shoot, shoot, shoot at the range. Yeah. I mean, extra it's, train. It's good to do things that are harder mm-hmm. at longer distances. It's like, you know, am I really going to need to draw and shoot in two seconds? I don't know. But it's not a bad skill to have. Right, mm-hmm. right. You know? I mean, the fact that you know that you can deliver a lethal shot at 25 or 72 yards, what you know, whatever it happens to be. Without right. a spotter. A, right. <laughs> don't happen to have one with you. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that's imp- you've got to know that. That's important stuff to know. Mm-hmm. Confidence is really important in all of this. Um, and there's false comp- confidence, which you see a lot of times when people come into a class I've been shooting all my life. I can do this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. And then there's the confidence that comes from competence. When you actually have been tested and trained and you know what you are doing, and that's a a more comfortable, maybe a deep-seated confidence. And I I think sometimes, I mean, I see it out here, but I've seen it in other classes. The more training you get at a place like Gunsight, the less inclined you are to need it because you really understand, I don't ever want to have to do this. The avoidance. Sure. Mm-hmm. Mindset is everything. Yeah. You have the mindset if you have to do it, but my goodness, I'm going to do anything to but shoot this person. To avoid yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's always easier to train the newbie person to take them to that nth degree, whatever it is that you're going with it, mm-hmm. than it is to take a person who has been shooting for 10, 20, you name the number of years. But I was in the right. service. Right. I was a cop. I, okay, yeah. well, oh, these gosh, things, I hear that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. these things are perishable. We know that. And, and the methods yeah. and modes and deliverance now with everything that we have is far different, uh, including the ammunition. I mean, that's changed why drastically, Why do I too. need training? I have YouTube. Right. You know what? I learned something. <laughs> I learned something every day. And I'm not necessarily shooting every day, but I go out to the classes and I take pictures. I'm the photographer and I listen and each instructor has something new to teach. And I love it. Like last week I learned gas, gas, coast, break. This instructor was teaching them. You come out of that holster fast. Mm -hmm. And then when you get pointed out onto the target, you go coast, coast, coast. And then when you pull the trigger, that's your break. It's interesting because that's another variation of the idea of you draw fast, you shoot slow. And I've seen really good people who are, I mean, the people who really know what they're doing. And they come out of the holster amazingly fast. And you think, what happened? They just stopped. But what they do is they come up, boom. Mm-hmm. It's that extra. It seems like it's forever, but it's actually a quarter of a second. Mm-hmm. You know, a half second it takes. But that's what allows them to put the shot where it's supposed yeah. to go. 
Get it out of the holster quickly, but there's no need to shoot fast. You need to shoot well. I learned that last week, and I practiced it today. Yeah? How did it work for you? It worked well until I got to 25 yards. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's, you know, as your distance increases, you generally need to slow down to get good hits. Yeah. Right. You need- I mean, when you're at three yards, you could just draw and blast away. You're there. Well, sure. It takes longer yeah. to acquire the uh, the proper sight picture with the further distance. Right. Now, is mm-hmm. it s- safe to assume you folks are saying you want to draw fast, but you don't want to practice, get right out of the get-go drawing fast. You want to be slow and methodical. Oh, not on and a get newbie. Oh, yeah. No, no. Right. No, on a newbie, I walk them through at grip. Clear, rotate, smack, glue. Yeah, nice and slow. Yes, very slow. And, and I tell people, I say, look, you need to do, and once you are taught how to do this, because the draw is not a natural thing, and everybody, if you, I would just say this right up front. If you have not been to a class, if you've not been taught how to do a proper draw, you are doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. Because everything you see on TV and everything you see in the movies is yep. wrong. But I watch you know, TV. It's just, yeah. you, you're doing it wrong, you know. Um, draw slowly. A thousand times mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to groove, groove, groove the motions. And yeah, you could speed up a little bit as you go along, okay. But you don't ever want to start doing it fast until you are just completely comfortable with it going. And I'm talking about fairly slow motion at first. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. one, two, yeah. three, four, five. And then all the way back in and reverse it. And you put it back in the holster slowly. Because speed holstering will end up with bullet holes in you. You go back the exact way you came out. Exactly. The same direction, but yes. not the same speed. Well, I don't want you hurrying up. That's for sure. No, no, no. no. I'm talk- but I'm talking about once you get to where you're drawing more quickly and you're yes. on the range and you're shooting, you shoot. You can draw quickly and shoot, but then you really slow it down to reholster. Yes. You know, reluctantly holster your. Oh, I like that. Reluctantly. Re- return it to the holster reluctantly. We're going to reluctantly Do I holster. Really? Is, is it really safe? Well, that's the other part. Is if you know, if you really did have to shoot in a gunfight, why are you putting it away? Don't be in a hurry. You know, bad guys travel in packs, just like wolves. I don't know. So, Michelle, you will be delighted to know that Jane Ann is a revolver fan. Is she's wearing her 1911, but I'll guarantee you she's got a, a revolver somewhere close by. Check her ankle. They're, Check her ankle. They're a beautiful dance. I love to watch a good revolver shooter <laughs> because it is a dance. When they're reloading, it's like, mm. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, that's an art it. on its own. Just like a lost art. art. And, <laughs> only, and only mastered by doing it over and over mm-hmm. a lot. Right, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. the, the same philosophy, you know, goes with a holstering that you just spoke about with being able to reload. You know, they mm-hmm. make they make moon clips for some guns that make it easy. They make, you know, HKS is probably the big one on the speed loader side of things that make the right. the speed loader that, you know, just like with magazines, you get speed loader cases and everything to wear one or two extra ones or whatever you want to do. But, uh, you know, those are all important components of what do I need? Not what do I want? Uh, what do I need? I was laughing. I, I, for some reason, I was watching a Max Michelle video a few days ago. And you can look it up on YouTube, and it's uh, Max Michelle fires, I don't know, it's like 18 shots in four seconds with, yeah. two, with two reloads. Well, I was going to... But what was amazing to me was the speed of the reloads. And I'm just thinking in terms of how many thousands of times had he sat there in a room just doing reloads, just doing... I mean, and this is not defensive mm-hmm. stuff. This is pure competition. But his speed of reload is so fast, and I guess the only point of that is I'm saying that you can get to be pretty good at this, but with everything you learn to do, it takes repetition. It right. takes lots and lots of times doing it over and over again. So my knife. It's right. It's right. Going to your knife and pulling it out. You're actually dry fire your knife. Mm-hmm. You practice drawing it out. Yep. Over and over and over. Well, yeah, especially some, some of these knives have safeties just like your firearms do. I mean, you've got to yeah, know I'm that not knife. Sure. I, want, I, don't, I don't want one of those. <laughs> right? Right? Right. No, and but I, some of them do. They have a lock. I mean, you got to know what you're yeah. getting into. I also Throw that away. don't want an automatic. <laughs> You push the button and it comes out. I'm frightened of them. Well, especially I don't where want you, one. yeah. Especially where you're carrying. <laughs> I was gonna say, especially exactly. where you're carrying. I mean, <laughs> yes. You don't want to just jump yes, into that. Yes, we were that. all thinking the same thing there. Yeah, oh. I don't want that. She mm. goes, ah, excuse me, I uh, got to be excused right now. <laughs> <laughs> Stab myself. <laughs> that wasn't Not the good. intent, yeah. but uh, it was distracting no. nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> the thumb motion would be important to me. Oh gosh. Yeah, and that's. Um, yeah, I don't want a knife with a positive lock on it because mm-hmm. I don't want to have to fumble with something. At the same time, 
if it's a an activation like you have with your thumb, you rotate it out. Once again, you need to have done it a thousand times, mm-hmm. so it's just completely natural to you. And can we say, uh, just like with everything else, it's very important that your knife stays clean. I mean, pocket oh, yeah. lint and everything else that gets built up into these knives, mm. it, it's important to keep them clean. Yeah, I pick up junk. Yeah, yeah, you'd and hate plastic to st- when you're opening packages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And the other thing is, just as you say, we all carry these pocket knives, and we use them for opening cardboard boxes mm-hmm. and everything else. Sharpen your mm-hmm. knife because it's going to get really dull if you don't. Yep. 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 If you don't know how to sharpen it, find somebody who does. You know, actually, interestingly enough, some of the companies who make knives will sharpen them for you for free when you send them back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, At the shot show, you can take them to um, oh. Benchmade, Benchmade and they'll Benchmade, sharpen yeah. your Benchmade right. knives for yep. you. Yeah. And, you know, you can, if you needed to do that, have two or three of them and rotate them. Mm-hmm. That Emerson way does that. Keep too. them sharp. Yeah. You know, some people can sharpen knives. I've never been able to do it well. It's just, you know, I don't have a man card for that. So there it is. There are some things your husband does for you, and that's one of my husband's uh, your, favorite your hu- things is to sharpen my knife because oh, cool. he knows I use it. Ah. He sharpens it almost every other day. Really? Wow. Yeah, he's a good guy. Can we send him our knives? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say. That'd be cool. <laughs> well, <laughs> while you're here, you should take advantage of it. Oh, I, I was going to give out his, your address on the, in the air. <laughs> Oh, but, yeah, you want to keep it clean because, God forbid, you stab somebody and gave them an infection. You know, you don't want to oh, do that. That's where you were going with that. <laughs> well, I wasn't, but that's okay. <laughs> that's right. Oh, yeah. And, and carry Band-Aids with you, too, just in case. <laughs> right. <you know. laughs> oh, my. Oh, well, guys, I have to get geared up because I'm going to get whooped up on, I guess, for a week here. Yes. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to it. This is going to be fun. Sounds like you need to put on some muscle rub already. <laughs> <laughs> can't take ibuprofen. I'm gonna get a, a gallon of Ben Gay or something. You know, <laughs> right. and have uh, Ben Gay. Have Steve Tarani check his PayPal account. Michelle and I just sent him a couple hundred bucks for. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I knew I could count on you. Go You're up always the there for us, will you? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, have a good week, and we will uh, do it again next week, unless the authorities find us. We keep running it from them. You know that goes. <laughs> Thanks, Gina. Nice to meet you guys again. Great talking with you. Thanks. Yeah, take care. Keep it up. All right. Bye, y'all. See you. Well, that wraps up another Gun Talk After Show. But if you want even more gun-related stuff, don't forget to check out Gun Dealio. It's the app for Apple and Android phones that connects you to all the Gun Talk shows, plus even more. And we'll catch you next time for the Gun Talk After Show. Yeah.